Chris Lynch with Air Park Canterbury. Park at 264 Russie Road and go in the draw to win a trip to Samoa. Airparkcanterbury.co.nz Prime Minister, good to see you. Thanks for your time. Good to be with Chris always. I want to start off with um, military academies. Yeah. We reported at Westfield Shopping Centre several days ago four young teenage girls about 15 years of age punched and kicked an elderly shop worker ran away, they still have not been caught. Mm. Are these the type of female offenders that you want to be seeing in boot camp? Yeah, well, I want to get on top of these serious young offenders exactly like that. I mean, we're seeing that up and down the country. It started with the ram raids, it started with increasing retail crime uh, and just senseless you know, acts of violence like that. We've got to get those young people out off the streets uh, to keep the rest of the community safe. But importantly, we've got to make powerful targeted interventions in those young people's lives because otherwise we know when they're 20 and when they're 25, where their life is going, uh, and it's not going to go to a good place. So the boot camps, you know, everyone wants to give me grief about it, and that's fine, but I don't care because we are going to try and do something quite different here. And we've taken the bits of learnings that we had from previous programs, other things that we've learned from defence and from police and from other community organisations, and we're putting a trial together this month uh, with 10 young people in a facility in Palmerston North, uh, a year-long program, uh, and three months residential, nine months um, getting back into the community again. So, yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. So we're giving the judges the powers to call what's called a serious young offender, um, and they can give them that designation, and they can also then direct them into military camps, um, academies as we see. And I think, you know, you're also seeing um, Oranga Tamariki under new leadership now is actually very conscious that it's got to do a much better job of managing these young people than it has been as well. Well, I hope so, because when you say Oranga Tamariki, the first thing I think of is KFC and McDonald's, yeah. and these young offenders are rewarded with fast food. And I just wonder whether Oranga Tamariki is up to the job. Yeah, I'll just say, look, Mike Bush went through there and did a root and brunch. He had a burger. Yeah, well, but he did a root and brunch sort of clean out as to what the challenges and the problems are. Karen Chu, as the new minister there, has had lived experience coming through the system. And I've got to say, having met with the team uh, and some of the changes they've made around management and um, you know what they've been doing with staffing, challenges that they've had and taking out a whole bunch of staff that have been you know, poor, poorly performing, uh, it's been actually very good. So, so I know there's a lot that we've got to do in Oranga Tamariki, and it's not been a perfect organisation, but I'm just saying, under the Mike Bush reset with Karen Chur as a new minister and a new uh, focus on the management team being very clearly directed by a new government about what we expect them to do. Um, yes, we've got the most vulnerable kids that we've got to manage in the country. The state has to do a much better job uh, and should be really doing everything it can to look after those young people. But we also got to make sure that we are putting them on the right trajectory. And that's where things like our social investment thinking comes in, which is essentially to say, righto, we know there's a persistent group of several hundred serious young offenders that are causing mayhem across the country. We almost know them by name. Um, so we can't just have them recycling through a family group conference and a wet bus ticket and sort of carrying on. We actually need to make interventions in these young people's lives. It's good for the community and it's ultimately good for them too. What has been abundantly clear when I've been reporting violent crime, youth crime in mm. Christchurch, uh, it's no surprise most of these children do come from broken families. Mm. They either don't have a dad in their life, um, their mum doesn't care about them, there's always something else yep. going on at home. Yep. So how do you target the families, not just the kids, because the kids are the ones that are coming from these dysfunctional families yep. where they want attention. So they'll go do a ram raid at the local mm. rebel store. They'll go and hurt somebody because for them, they've got nothing to lose. Yeah, you're exactly right. And you've done a great job. I've watched you over the last couple of years following those cases through and you've actually understood the issues well. Um, on the military academies, for example, we're putting the community organisations in from day one. Because one of the big learnings from before when we had it back under the key era was that there wasn't, um, they didn't have the community organisations and those same young people might change their lives in a residential program while they're away from that environment and they're put straight back into the environment that they were part of. And so we have to actually manage that transition back into the community and it may well be that they don't go live back at home, that they actually go live with an uncle and auntie. You know, I met with three Ram Raiders, you know, 14, 15 and 16 and they were now with a very strict uncle and auntie in a different part of the city uh, and the reason was that they were under a much different management regime at home uh, than what they had been before and that was making big difference in their lives. So it's all of that work that we've actually got to do so that actually we don't just have a, a wonderful time uh, at the residential program uh, where they are learning new skills and a lot about themselves but then as you can say for a 15 year old to go back into the old environment mm. that's not great so we've got to make sure we do that. We're also going to make sure that in the program we're actually reaching out to those families and also the siblings because actually the siblings and those families are also potential candidates for 
uh, getting on the wrong path as well. And so we want to make sure that we, we keep it, uh, the family content pretty high and bring the family into a lot of that as well. Just in layman's terms, and I don't need you to talk about what they're going to have for breakfast, lunch or dinner, yeah. but on a day, daily basis, tell the New Zealand public how you see these military academies working just on a very layman's terms. Will it be a classroom base? Are they going to be doing press-ups? I mean, how do you see it effectively working on a daily basis? The first thing is in the three-month residential program and then nine-month you know, into, into the community program. Uh, but the community program's in there from day one. Is Yes, look, there is a lot of actual dis- discipline. Wake up, make your bed, do the routine. Because often these kids don't have any structure or any of that stuff. And so we've learned a lot of that from the military experience of what they need to do. Yes, there'll be uh, physical exercises that they'll need to do, um, but it's about discipline. Um, it's about um, you know, self-esteem uh, and confidence, and it's also about ultimately teamwork and some of those kind of values and, and things that we need them to get that experience in that residential program. The sense that they often feel helpless about themselves, they don't like themselves. There's a whole bunch of issues that we've got to deal with in that space. So that's what that program will be doing, but also the community's in there from day one to make sure that you know, if it's a young person who's got an addiction problem or an alcohol problem or um, you know, a trauma from abuse, you know, we actually understand those issues and we're working with those young people from the go. And it might be time out with a, in, in, a, in a setting in an office with a counselling session. It could be a bunch of different things. But the benefit is, yes, it's expensive, but we're actually making powerful targeted interventions one-on-one. And with 10 kids, we can actually manage that program and get something that's quite tailored. Uh, we believe. Um, and How is this going to be different from the previous government's efforts where if somebody committed a RAM raid, there was some kind of program wraparound support that was given to these kids? And I've got to say, touch wood, I haven't been seeing as many RAM raids in Christchurch. So does that suggest that that program that the Labor government introduced is working, or does it suggest they're simply behind bars, or is it um, a bit of both, or did I, it work? I, I, think, I think we're seeing a little bit of diminution of RAM raids, which is a good thing. Mm. There's been some morphing into some other different types of crime uh, that's been going. And I think it's no silver bullet. I think it's a series of things that we're all trying to do. So... You know, if you want to actually put your crime up on social media, that's a problem in sentencing. That's going to be a, a, an issue for us. But it is actually even like Oranga Tamariki in the last six months, you know, I know that they are now very conscious of the individuals that the police are referring to them and making sure that they actually are getting the right intervention with that individual. So, you know, there's, there's a lot more to do, and, and, and it's imperfect. I get all that. But what we're trying to do here is just keep moving it forward every 13 weeks, every quarter, to make sure that we're getting the settings and the environment right um, to, 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 to get on top of, of what's been a, a real you know, increase in crime. I mean, we've had a 33% increase in violent crime, 50% growth in gangs, 100% increase in retail crime, and we've had four, four, a quadrupling of ram raids. So that's the starting point. So let's focus on trying some different things to get some different outcomes. What do you say to the parents of these, presumably they've got parents of these 14, 15-year-old girls who think it's acceptable to punch and kick? a shopkeeper yeah. doing his job at Westfield. What would you say to the parents? Well, we've got to call parents to responsibility because, you know, you had these kids. These are your primary responsibility in life is to get your kid from a state of dependence to independence and healthy adulthood. Uh, and so, yeah, parents have to be called to, to, to responsibility and accountability as well. And, uh, you know, they need to be sitting down with those young people and be investing in them. I mean, uh, parenting's hard work. It's really hard work. I get it. You know, it's very challenge, most challenging job you'll ever do and it's also the most rewarding job, frankly. Um, but, you know, parents need to be active. They need to be intentional in their kids' lives. They need to be determined to make sure their kids are set up to do better than themselves. That's really what the, the progress of humankind's been about. Every generation does better than the one before it. Uh, and a big part of that is parents have a big responsibility to play. You mentioned something that sounds... Um almost a little wussy, but it's actually quite true. You talk about self-esteem that these kids don't have, and you're right. I want to mm. uh, pick you up on that because I uh, was doing a video for a client recently, a, yeah. you know, a commercial uh, client, and there was a 15-year-old boy that I came across um, that uh, it, I guess was on the front pages of um, various um, national newspapers for the amount of crime he had committed, but he was in an apprenticeship, mm-hmm. and I went up to him and I said, wow, good for you, you know, mm. you've turned your life around, you're doing really, really well. And I mm. said to him, I'm really proud of you, good for you. Mm. And he looked really shell-shocked. Mm. He didn't know what to say. And it made me really sad because I thought, no, nobody's ever told him yeah. the good stuff he's done. Yeah, that's and that right. does come down to self-esteem. Yep. And by the sounds of it, he had none. Yeah, and I honestly, when you sit down with these young people, I've, I remember spending half a day with 
three RAM rated kids, 14, 15, 16. Some of them are quite yeah. smart. Uh, oh, they are, uh, very much the case. But they, but they haven't been told that they're smart. They've been told that they're useless, that they can't achieve anything. Mm. So as a result, their worldview about what's possible ends up getting shrunken. And there's a whole bunch of issues about that. Mm. And that's why I want those community organisations in there from day one. So yes, we've got to teach them discipline. And yes, we've got to make sure that they understand rights and responsibilities. But we've also got to work with that young person who may not have been told, hey, listen, we love you, we care about you, and mm. you've got great potential. And everyone's got great potential, do you know what I mean? And that's why we're making these interventions, because otherwise we know what's happening to that 15-year-old's life at 20 to 25. They're in the adult criminal justice system. They could be in prison for half their life by the time they're 50. Um, So why wouldn't we take some of that money that we're going to spend over the next 25 years knowing what outcome's going to happen and actually try and change it and lift them up and actually give them a better shot at life? So so it's a combination, and that's what I'm saying. Everyone's wanted to dumb down the boot camps as being very binary and very simplistic and very militaristic and punitive. Mm. It's not. It's actually about saying, look, we're going to try and give these kids the best shot that we can to turn them around because it's in all of our interests that they actually get more fulfilling lives. But I agree with you. I think young people, they just want to know that, hey, someone cares about them, someone loves them, and they have potential. Mm. And someone's going to stand beside them and invest in them and actually care about them. How, I know it's a pilot program. How will you know or what will you base the success or otherwise on it? How will you know that these kids are going in a better direction? And how can you then stand up on that podium of truth yeah. and say, it's been a success, we're going to continue it? Yeah. What does success for you look like when it comes to these military academies is what I'm it's asking. It's getting young people to understand that they have rights and responsibilities in the society that they're part of, making sure that we actually can uh, stop the recidivism uh, and actually have them, you know, not, we want them to walk away from a, a path of crime uh, and, and, um, and violence. Uh, and actually, yeah, that's what we want to see at the end of these programs. And so, um, yes, as we go through the program, there'll be learnings of, right, have we got the balance right between the different components? Actually, we need more of this, less of that. Um, and that's what we really want to understand as to what's working um, well through the pilot. But look, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just up for trying anything because, you know, what happens next is we just say, well, that's just how New Zealand is now. We're happy with that level of violent crime. We're happy with that level of youth offending. We're happy with that level of growth in gang memberships and retail crime. And, and either we can choose to say, OK, that's just how it is, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, or otherwise we choose to do something about it. And the last six years showed us um, what we were doing was not working. So let's do something different. And that's why over the last you know uh, six months we've worked pretty hard at it. So you know we've put in place in that first 100 days a lot of our law and order policies. We've now run them through Parliament. A law, before it becomes law in New Zealand, has to go through Parliament three times and have a public consultation, typically. Uh, And so you'll see in August, September, all of our gang laws start to be passed into formal law in New Zealand. That means in October, November, the police have got new powers to deal with illegal guns, to deal with gang members associating, gang patches. Um, We've got our work on sentencing coming, which is limiting the discounts that judges can apply. We've got the serious young offender designation and the the first pilot academy going off this next month. We've got 500 more cops. We're putting more cops on the beat in CBD, the community beat teams. And 10 more in Christchurch here as well. 10 more in Christchurch for the CBD here. Um, In Auckland, I don't know when the Christchurch ones will be in play, but I know in Auckland we've got 51 more cops uh, in place by the end of July in downtown Auckland CBD, which has been really challenged at the moment. Um, And the same 17 into Wellington, 10 into Christchurch as well. So it's, it's a combination of just getting all of those things moving uh, and biting uh, so that we can actually get the change we all want to see, which is less crime and people feeling safer. What I've noticed in the press releases from the police team based in Wellington and Auckland, I'm noticing more of a harder approach. We won't tolerate this. Uh, boy races are not welcome. Is that a directive from the likes of the commissioner and the likes from Mark Mitchell telling police you need to be a bit firmer with the New Zealand public now saying what is or isn't acceptable because I've noticed that change in tone. Yeah, so we have, Mark and I have very clear expectations of police. Uh, We want a back-to-basics policing approach. We want a frontline presence. Um, We want to make sure that they are tough on gangs. There's been a number of, for example, gang... And that includes the public relations? Yeah, yeah, gang tunnies, for example, and funerals that have taken place. And before we would see gangs running amok through that process... If you just reflect on the last seven to eight months, that's been managed incredibly well. The, gang, the police have really stepped up their presence there. 
you would have seen two weekends ago, um, the police response to boy races, um, which is you know zero tolerance for that. It's a major you know, anti-social behaviour, public nuisance, and get all that stuff. Um, you're seeing it now with the police saying, OK, of those 500 police officers, we're now deploying more into highly visible places where there are hotspots, CBD areas, where there's been huge amounts of crime, particularly downtown Auckland's been you know, uh, very, very difficult. Um, so that's a, an example of, and that's why I'd always said in opposition, you know, the government sets the tone from the top and says, hang on, no, we have rights and responsibilities in this country. You can't just take the rights, you have to hold the responsibilities too, and we expect to restore law and order so people feel safer. And that message and our letters of expectation have been pretty laid out to the police. So, so I think the combination is actually working very well, um, and you're seeing police, um, you know, that we've always had awesome police officers and they do a great job in the front line, but we want to make sure we're supporting them as well. And we as government are doing our job by giving them the powers and the tools that they need to be effective, you know. Council funding. Um, I often watch the Christchurch City Council um, discussions and debate at one o'clock in the morning. On You're YouTube. a political junkie, my friend. Do you watch no, one of the sad. three people that watch Parliament TV in the country as well? Actually, not much. No, I don't. I find that boring. But for some reason, I find I'll it. try and make it more interesting. Could you make it? Better? Thank you. I do often watch the, the council things on YouTube anyway. Yeah, good, man. They seem frustrated at the fact that they want to be able to get some of their planning on transport decisions completed but they're having trouble doing so because they don't know if the government's going to be funding what transport project we're in next. And, and, the, yeah. and, and the debate, are, and, and some of the debates at the moment are around, we don't know whether we should continue because we don't know if the government's going to give us funding or not. But of course, those who are advocating for the likes of more public transport or cycleways are saying, doesn't matter, let's just get the council to fund it. So when is the government going to say, here's what we will and here's what we won't fund when it comes to your transport in Christchurch. Yeah, I'm not sure that's 100% fair because we do have what's called a, um, you know, we have a national transport plan, which Simeon Brown has been really good at, um, and it's got a big set of investment in there. Um, We've got our 17 roads of national significance. We've created a new category of roads of regional significance. Um, Obviously, the government deals with the state, you know, network um, and road network and the national road network and and councils uh, deal with local roads. You know, that's their responsibility. I think for councils, my general message is they need to do exactly what families, businesses and what you've seen the central government do over the last budget. You know, we just saved $24 billion in savings over the next four years out of central government spending. Um, they need to stop the dumb stuff. They need to be on top of their numbers. They need to choose the must-do stuff, stuff, do the basics well. For you, what's dumb stuff? Well, I've seen councils up and down the country, you know, go and invest in things that is not core infrastructure, for example. You know, water pipes getting out of hand, say, in Wellington, for example, while there's above-the-ground vanity projects being built. Uh, you know, that's an example where, you know, you need to deliver the core services to the local people that put you in like vanity projects that. what like little colored painted lines or, or what do you we've got crazy things where we've seen yeah you know, half a million Planted dollars boxes. spent on a on a on a pedestrian crossing as part of a road initiative you know and let's get wellington moving for example but isn't it a good thing you know keeping pedestrians safe? No, no that's all good stuff but what i'm saying is there's a real ask as there is in businesses and family budgets and where you've just demonstrated in the central government's budget that local councils have that responsibility to do to do that as well but there's also things you've got to think very smartly about. So, for example, in Auckland, you know, they've got this thing called Water Care, which manages all their oh, free yes. waters assets, right? And the Auckland Council has have had to be funding all this investment in new sewerage systems and new pipes and all that stuff. Same problem in many parts of the, of the country. Christchurch is actually in fairly good shape with their assets here, given they've all been recently rebuilt. But, for, but what we did there is actually separated the water care assets away from the council, so there's still local control and ownership, but they could now set themselves up and actually go borrow five, you know, up to five times their earnings, essentially, to actually uh, fund their future investment pipeline over the next 30 years. They take a long-term loan out for 30 to 50 years, and they can consistently, year in, year out, plan for that investment that they need to do, rather than doing ad hoc projects um, at a certain period of time. So now that they can get their own money raised, then the council in Auckland's now got $800 million that it was previously spending on that stuff that it now is actually freed up. And the council rates program went from 25% increase in rates down to a 7% increase in rates because we structured that differently. And so, you know, you've got councils that have got local assets that could be recycled. You've got councils that have actually got different structures that would be possible around management of three waters where they're often putting a lot of the investment into pipes and stuff. Um, and that just need, needs to be sophisticated and that needs to be thought through strategically because when you make those changes to those organising structures, you can create quite a lot of extra value, as we've just seen in Auckland. So are you suggesting stick to your infrastructure, stick to common sense as to what the public wants? 
Yeah, just, just, I mean, I would just challenge all councils, deliver what your local communities want. You're, you're the voice of the local community um, who are going through day-to-day living in your city. And so, you know, and you want to do a great job delivering for your people by delivering the things that matter most to them. I drove through Brougham Street today. Yeah. I was actually almost late because it's just, it's madness. Megan Woods has said the government doesn't really care about Christchurch, given the fact that uh, the government decided to ditch the the, the so called upgrades to Brougham Street. Oh, I mean, I know what you, a load of rubbish and no disrespect, but I'm not taking any lectures from Megan Woods, who was senior minister in a government for six years that really stuffed the country and frankly stuffed Christchurch. So, um, yeah, no disrespect, um, very little time for what Megan has to say about any of that stuff. Uh, where we are is we've got a major set of um, roading infrastructure that is in massive deficit. And as you know, we've got 62,000 potholes, we've got 17 roads of national sniffing that we've got to do. We've got a lot of regional roads we've got to do. Um, so where we are on Brougham Street from memory is that um, you know, that is not um, made our core priority set that we've got to deal with. We're going to do the Wood End Bypass. We're going to do Belfast to Pegasus. We've got State Highway 1. I think we've got some Horsewall local road stuff that we've got to do as well. When it's, it, but what we're going to do yeah. is complete the design work and should we be in a position then to, we know what we would do if we could get that cash flowing through. But I just say, look, I mean, there's been a huge investment into Christchurch over many over the last decade, as you're well aware of, with the rebuild. Um, and it's not, and, and we are continuing to invest in Christchurch. Um, but we've got a massive, um, massive uh, challenge that we've inherited from Megan Woods and the previous administration not managing our roading network well at all. Um, we are looking at things like congestion charging to in order to lower um, you know, congestion. Uh, across the cities um, where that could be appropriate um, and we'll continue to look at those sorts of things but you know we've got a massive program on investment in roads um, we've got some big things that we you know, and the way you've got to think about it is what's the projects that will make the biggest difference to the most amount of people in the fastest amount of time and that's the must do stuff um, and unfortunately in a priority set we're, yes we're going to carry on and complete the design work for Brougham Street but we actually um, haven't at this point secured the funds to actually go make that change and I know that may not be what people want to hear but what they do want to hear is me being quite straight and direct about what a hard yes or a hard no as to what we can and can't do at this point. Prime Minister Christopher Luxon, good to see you. Thank good you to see time. you. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Appreciate it.